So uh, as you all know, and why we're all here tonight, we do uh, a lecture, a science lecture every month. And uh, we used to have them in our classroom and hopefully we'll get back to doing that again, maybe in November. Uh, you know, we did, we had Bob Meadows here not too long ago. And uh, you know, we need to uh, hopefully hopefully we'll get all vaccinated and, and uh, not have to worry about the COVID stuff anymore. But until then, we've got uh, great speakers from all over the world that have been joining us. And uh, tonight's no exception. And really pleased to have uh, Dr. Bob back again to the Westport Astronomical Society Science Lecture Series. So, so thanks to everybody on Zoom tonight and YouTube um, and everybody that came from Meetup too. So let me tell you a little bit about Dr. Bob. He's got a heck of experience. Uh, from 92 to 97, Dr. Bob worked at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore and he supported operations of the Hubble Space Telescope there. And he did the first two servicing missions, one with my crazy old buddy, Story Musgrave, and uh, then got to conduct research after he did all that on the telescope. So as a flight controller, Dr. Bob was part of the assembly team of the ISS and then supported six ISS assembly flights. And a flight director since 2005, he's uh, supported six other shuttle missions. So really amazing time at the bench here. So he's taken three rides on the Vomit Comet. Uh, why would you do more than one? I can imagine. <laughs> I mean, it would be fun, I guess, but wow. We have to find out, did, did you put the, the vomit in the comet? And he has over 7,000 hours of real-time console experience. And, you know, with a little spare time that he seems to have, he wrote a book back in 2018 on the operation of the ISS called the International Space Station, Operating an Outpost in the New Frontier. Well, Dr. Bob is currently the lead flight director for Boeing's CST-100 Starliner Commercial Crew Program operation. And that'll be an interesting talk. I want to hear all about that and where it's at. And that's operated right out of Houston in Mission Control. So please welcome back the recipient of the NASA Steely-Eyed Missile Man Award, Dr. Bob Dempsey, to the September 2021 free Westport Astronomical Society Science Lecture Series. Dr. Bob, welcome back. Uh, it's a pleasure. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, great. Okay, let me start sharing. And uh, no, I did not uh, offer up any of the vomit on the comet. Um, <laughs> it's 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 quite an experience. It's fun. Uh, can you see the slides? Okay. Yes, we can. Uh, oh, before okay. I start, I just want. To, I'm sorry. I, I was going to say that looks like one of Dana's shots. <laughs> um, you know, watching Cal do his Stellarium stuff reminded me, you know, I used to teach astronomy in a planetarium and always loved to put up the star ball now and then and show people stuff. And students always wanted to see the uh, constellations, of course. Uh, but I grew up in Detroit. So what I'd always have to do is I'd have to bring the lights up, find the two or three stars that I was used to looking at, and then find the constellation. Um, so it, it's kind of cool to see the tools that we have available today to, to do to some of this stuff. So uh, let me get in and tell you a little bit about um, uh, flight control and one of the um, situations that we've had uh, during my time as a, as a flight director. And, uh, you know, this is the type of stuff that like any, I guess, you know, war hero type thing that you can go on and on with all kinds of stories. Um, but uh, I thought this would be a good one to kind of illustrate a little bit to you, uh, you know, how flight control works. And, uh, you know, when you're faced with uh, things that you never thought could happen, even though it's your job to think of things that you didn't think were going to happen, uh, how you can get through that. So, um, this is the flight control room. This is what you probably are used to seeing at, uh, uh, you know, a NASA TV. This is a, a room, and, and they look very similar to any satellite or any control room around the world, where you have a number of people sitting at consoles, computer consoles, and uh, you have in the front room big screens of uh, uh, what we call our situational awareness displays. And in this configuration that you're seeing here, uh, I am in the lower right hand corner there if you can see it and I'm doing a handover to another flight director who's uh, 
uh, taken over here. And this uh, this is a re related to uh, at the end of my talk, I'll talk a little bit about the commercial crew program. And this is us practicing uh, that you can if you can see my mouse where the uh, the Boeing Starliner is docking with the space station. So we've got a simulated video of docking. Uh, this is a, a relative motion plot, um, and uh, here's the team working around trying to do that. So, uh, as you introduce me, flight director, what exactly is a flight director? Well, this is a flight director. Actually, that's Ed Harris playing probably one of our most famous flight directors, Gene Krantz, uh, in the movie Apollo 13. And not only is that a good picture for you guys to get an idea what a flight director does, um, but it uh, is a good throw to the movie Apollo 13. Uh, I'm guessing with this crowd, you've all seen it. If not, you definitely have to go see it. But it is actually fairly accurate. It is so accurate that we use it to train new flight controllers when they come into the job. So it's got a lot of really great stuff in it. Now, when I became a flight director, um, you know, we all have our own call signs. Uh, Gene Kranz here shown uh, was wearing a white uh, vest and uh, he was white flight and his wife used to make those uh, vests for him. The first three flight directors were red, white, and blue. They were very patriotic by the time I came along. Uh, all the cool callers and uh, the cool stars had been selected. So I went a different route honoring my uh, um, background. And this is my patch, my call sign on Galileo flight. And uh, I think you can probably get a lot of the symbology right there. Now I do have to say, uh, was flight director is probably a better term, though I'm still technically a flight director, but uh, um, a few weeks ago, I came over temporarily and I'm now the deputy chief scientist for the International Space Station. And what that does is that uh, I'm now in charge of uh, prioritizing what research gets done on the space station. And then when things break, as you'll see that happens, um, you know, what is the priority, how to get it fixed and stuff like that. So that's a new role I'm doing right now and uh, I'm enjoying it. I've only been doing that for a couple weeks. But the story I'm going to tell you about tonight is back from the flight director days. Now, uh, I don't want to take too much time. Uh, I, I wanted to give you a quick sort of summary of the space station. Uh, I think he recorded uh, my last talk, and I did go into a little more detail that time, uh, so you can always check that out. But uh, uh, just to give you a, a, a size, uh, an idea of size and scope and some of the things we're going to be talking about tonight. So um, we, it was a major construction project. It's still ongoing. Uh, Space Station has been uh, uh, going for over 21 years now. Uh, first element was launched in uh, 98. And then actually uh, in November of uh, 2000 was when we had our first manned mission to the crew to the uh, Space Station. And it's been continuously uh, habitated since then. So we've been doing a lot of uh, exploring up there since then. We've had over 230 launches to help us assemble it, maintain it, take up a, a research, take down research samples, take astronauts up and down. And we've conducted over 200 spacewalks to assemble it and uh, again, to maintain it. And to date, a little over 240 people, individual people, some multiple times, but uh, over 240 people have visited the space station. This is, how the ISS looks assembled. So you can see that it's about the size of a football field. And uh, I don't think I need to tell this group here, but if you see uh, a rapidly moving object that you know is not a planet and you identify as a satellite and it's the brightest of them all, uh, that is this guy. Um, and what we're gonna be talking about today, this is the uh, completely assembled International Space Station. You've got these 
uh, cylindrical, cylindrical uh, volume shaped areas. That's where the astronauts live and work. Um, and then you have uh, this giant truss structure here in the center. And you have these solar rays that were attached out here. There's, there's four sets, on, two on each side. Uh, these can gimbal. What that means is they rotate uh, around this axis so on the truss. Um, and they can also pivot a little bit. But the key thing here is they rotate. So as the space station is going around the Earth, uh, you can always keep them pointing to the sun so that you get your power generated. Now, as you can tell here, this is, you know, 32,000 cubic feet uh, and nearly a million pounds. Actually, today, I think it is close to uh, closer to a million pounds. Um, you can't take it up in a single rocket. So each piece was taken up like so. When you look at one of these modules, like right here, I'm circling, circling the, um, the Japanese module. Uh, that would fit into the cargo bay of the space shuttle. And you would take it up and then use the either the robotic arm on the space shuttle or this robotic arm that was on the space station, uh, which is like about 80 feet long. And you would take the, um, the, the module out of the space shuttle and attach it here like a tinker toy. So every one of these pieces was put together over time, a number of launches, including these solar arrays. And obviously, these solar arrays uh, did not launch in these extended positions. Uh, these are kind of like, uh, you know, the old-fashioned um, window blinds that can roll up or extend. And they were launched in a rolled-up fashion. And then once it was attached to the truss, uh, they were extended to their permanent position. And I mentioned the robotic arm, but this is an example uh, picture of the robotic arm. Um, it has uh, end effectors on each end, which basically are claws. It can uh, grab either end, um, and then it has these booms. Now, in this picture, it's shown on the uh, mobile transporter, which is basically like a little choo-choo train, and you can see some highlighted train tracks here, so this could move up and down uh, the truss segment. And it also is shown here in this picture with the special purpose dexterous manipulator, which is these additional arms. And what's cool about these things is one of these arms can like pull out a broken unit while the other one puts in a replacement unit. So this is very handy on orbit. We did not have it at the time of this story. And the robotic arm is actually controlled by a computer system uh, on, the, uh, on the inside by the astronauts. So that's some real quick background on it. Why am I telling you all about this detail? Well, it's all very important as we'll see tonight. So uh, this is when what would seem like a fairly small innocuous problem becomes a very significant problem. And this occurred in February of 2010. So at that day and age, this is what the space station looked like. It was just uh, a few modules here along the center line here, um, but it was enough of a volume that we had astronauts living there. We had a little core of the, uh, uh, the truss segment there. Uh, you're mostly seeing these solar rays here that are in front here are on the Russian side. You see a Russian Soyuz hanging there on the bottom. That's how the astronauts uh, primarily would go uh, to and from the space station in these days. But we needed a lot of power, so we had one solar array uh, installed. Now, you'll probably be going, now, wait a second, Dr. Bob, you showed me these sitting on the side. Well, first of all, you'll notice we don't have the truss, so there's nowhere for them to sit. And second of all, I think you guys are well aware that even at uh, you know, the altitudes that the space station flies at, uh, you still have some atmospheric drag. Um, so if we were to stick this off on the side for a number of years while we put other modules on here, uh, we would have an uneven pressure and we didn't want to have that. So this solar array was temporarily installed on the Zenith side of the space station with the plan that uh, when we added solar arrays, we would retract them and then uh, we would detach this, use the robotic arm and attach it out to the end of the space station. So here's a little while later, 
And this is a really nice picture. You can see a, a top-down view of the, the Russian modules here that I was pointing out. Uh, you could, the more silver ones are the US side of the space station. Uh, and you can see we now have two uh, nominally parked uh, solar array panel sets. Um, and you can see now that we've retracted those ones I showed you in the previous picture. And you can guess why, because, you know, if this guy was extended out here to the port side and this guy was rotating to uh, uh, track the sun, it would rip each other off. So uh, when this was installed, this was retracted. And when this one was installed, this one were retracted. Now we've got two of the, the four sets here. Uh, these white things sicken off are radiator panels. We uh, generate a lot of heat on the space station so that uh, we have to get rid of it. So in uh, February 2010, uh, it was now time to uh, take those solar rays, the uh, what was called the P6 segment. Now this is how it actually went up in the space shuttle. And then it was attached to that zenith side of the space station. And then those arrays were um, uh, deployed. Now we folded them up. And what happened is we um, uh, took that robotic arm that I was showing you earlier, uh, you know, detached it from the top of the space station. And actually, not shown here in this picture, uh, we handed it off to the space shuttle robotic arm to kind of hold it for a little bit while this little change car, the, the mobile transporter went down to the end, handed it back and then it took it and then it just kind of slid it in here and attached it to that uh, uh, end of the truss. And you can see now it can extend and be away from any other uh, set of arrays. So there's no collision issues. So when you deploy one of these solar arrays, this is how it looks like when it's coming out of the, the blanket box, as this part is called here. And again, I, I describe this as kind of a, uh, um, a window um, blind, you know, where it would kind of roll up. But instead of rolling up, these were uh, flat squares. These are a bunch of solar array cells, and they kind of... Uh, uh, go in kind of horizontal sheets that they just fold. You can kind of see the folding here a little bit in here. And then this mast, as it extends, um, you know, these slowly come out of the blanket box. There's one on top and bottom and they extend and they just get bigger and bigger and bigger and all is good. Um, what you can not see in this picture and you can see a little bit better in this picture uh, this is a ground model, um, but uh, you can see here's these upper uh, blanket box. You can see the, the sheets of the solar rays, the gray stuff here, uh, a little hinge. And then it might be hard for you to make out on the internet here, but there's actually a guide wire that's going from uh, top to bottom here. And uh, that's to kind of help keep the blankets from, uh, you know, as they extend to keep in position. So in uh, February of this year, uh, the space shuttle was docked. It had brought a new module that had been attached to the front of the space station. And it was in the process that it, it had, in the middle of the mission, it had moved this set of solar rays off to the port side. And we were at kind of the easy part of the mission where you just extend this solar array box and it was gonna go out and be real pretty. And now I know you guys are familiar with Apollo 13 where they go, you know, Houston, we had a problem. Uh, you know, you never wanna hear statements like this, but you know, we were hearing the astronauts go, oh, that looks so beautiful. That looks beautiful. That doesn't look right. Oh no. I think we better stop. And that's when, you know, your heart sinks and it's like, what, 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 you know, what, what, what just happened? So when we got a chance to look at it, this is what we discovered. So there was that guide wire I was talking about that was going through here. And apparently unbeknownst to us, when we had folded the blankets back up uh, earlier uh, in the year, some sort of snag on that wire occurred. And then when we were folding, unfolding it, 
mm -hmm. uh, it just started to tear. So what you can see here, if you can see this big red uh, bracket here, uh, that's a hole. That black there is a big rip in there. So we had a big hole. And then, of course, you can see here it's crunched on the edge where we've got this snag highlighted in the red hair. Mm -hmm. So uh, we were in the process of basically tearing the solar array apart. Here's a little bit better of a close up picture. You can clearly see that guide wire. Um, and here's kind of where a grommet got snagged and you can see this torn back panel. So this is what we were faced with. Okay, well that sure doesn't look good, but you know, how bad could it be? Well, pretty bad. Um, while I showed you that picture earlier where you could see the, the solar rays, you know, they look like they're big, rigid, solid things. They're not, they're very flappy. Um, uh, they flex a lot. And I think I saw that you have a, uh, a speaker from the science, uh, Space Telescope Science Institute coming up in a few weeks. And if you want, you can talk to her about flappy uh, panels because we had that problem on the Hubble early on. Um, so flexure is a real problem, but the thing is, because we couldn't get it into its fully extended position, um, they basically uh, were flexible. I mean, they could literally flap like a bird, and um, that's not structurally sound. And in fact, you can't undock the space shuttle in this condition because um, the, the shuttle was massive, you know, many, many... Uh, many metric tons. So when you undocked it, there was this huge vibration and we knew that these solar arrays would just flap like crazy. Well, that's not good because not only could they just break, you know, if they flex too much, they might just snap off or, uh, and or they could hit the space station or the shuttle. And as I think you guys are aware, those structures are relatively weak and uh, it would not be hard to punch a hole in them. So that would be really bad. Okay, so we can undock the shuttle, but you know, is that really a big problem? Well, yes, because we had been in space uh, for a number of days at this point, and the space shuttle can only be in space for, at, at, at this time and configuration, about 12 days. And at that point, you run out of fuel, uh, oxygen, water, uh, food, stuff like that, and, uh, you know, it's just a really bad day. So, this is a case, you know, I, I often describe flight control as hours of tedium uh, punctuated by moments of terror. And the reason why is, you know, we spend many, many months preparing for the missions. We try to think of everything that can go wrong, uh, and then we plan, and we train it, and we do everything we can. And when things are going smoothly, uh, you know, when you've simulated something five or 10 times and it's going smoothly, you kind of like, eh, okay, you know, this, you know, you go through the motions. But then when you have a problem like this, you know, the adrenaline kicks in, the brain cells fire out and fire up and you've got to figure out what to do. So the, 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 the lion that is NASA roared to life that night. And again, I'm going to reference the movie Apollo 13 uh, if you can picture the scene where they're talking about the carbon dioxide filter and uh, they're, you know, they're saying, hey, you know, we, we're going to kill the crew if we can't figure out how to uh, take one of the uh, command module uh, carbon dioxide filters and put it into the, the lunar module that they were using as a life bulb. And if you can remember that scene where they take this big bucket of crap and they throw it on a table and they say, that's what the astronauts have and we've got to figure it out. That's the kind of moment we were in, and that was very real. So everyone ran everywhere to try and figure out what to do. I mean, could we repair the solar array? Um, could we lock it into position partially deployed? Could we uh, shake it loose? What could we do? Uh, so every aspect around uh, NASA um, got to working the problem. One of the things we did is a, a group of us ran out to, uh, we have this ginormous mock-up building, um, you know, because uh, a mock-up is, is just an amazing when you really need to try and figure something out. 
And we actually had a full scale solar array out there. And here's a, a picture of it. And, uh, you know, we're kind of deploying it. This gives you uh, some scale there because we've got some humans there. And, uh, um, you know, they're trying to look it over. Now, what someone had come up with, and I'm not exaggerating here. This is, you know, people were sitting around and go, okay, what can we do? And people would throw out the craziest ideas and then we'd go, okay, well, that won't work because of this, that, or what, or, you know, whatever. And we came up with this idea of cufflinks. And basically what cufflinks were, were some sort of giant, um, metal wire that was stiff that we could somehow link in, uh, you know, we had these grommet holes that I mentioned where the guide wires were, and we've got these holes. And if we could link some wire in here and put it on two sides uh, and do it in multiple places over that torn uh, array, maybe we could continue to stretch it out and it won't tear apart that would give us some sort of structural support that would uh, keep it going. So we said, hey, that might work. Uh, so we started thinking about what kind of materials we had and uh, what we could do. And um, so we went over there and we made some of these cufflinks. And we have an astronaut here. This is uh, Steve Swanson, uh, who, uh, you know, had trained and stuff like that. So, you know, he, he knew spacewalk. So he's like, hey, let's get him out here and see, see if he thinks this is easy to do, hard to do, uh, whatnot. And he's working with one of these makeshift cufflinks that we had uh, generated uh, in that array. Now, you'll also notice he's wearing gloves because uh, you don't want to do it with like this guy's hands and go, oh, God, this was easy. I could easily do that. And then a spacewalking astronaut using gloves like this can't do it. So we had to come up with a way to make it actually pretty easy and idiot proof. Um, and we were testing it here. So uh, here's a nice little side view. Um, we basically took uh, almost kind of like an alligator clip type thing that you can see here um, that can, to bend, you can kind of see it, it uh, uh, is kind of narrow and it's tied to that wire. And then you stick it through the hole and then you can kind of tug on it. And if you can see here in this picture, um, it's now that that little metal sidebar cinches up next to the solar array and it's now locked into position. So we tested this and we said, okay, that seems to work. Um, what else can we do? Uh, next thing we did is one of the things that makes doing this job so fun, um, just when you don't think it uh, could be exciting enough, uh, we donned our scuba equipment and dove into the neutral buoyancy lab. Uh, now, this was not actually this mission. This was another mission I worked where at 4 a.m. we had to go and do a similar type thing. But it's the same thing. I don't have any pictures from that. But uh, that's me there in that outfit. And uh, what we did is we went out in the water uh, and we practiced it to see, you know, when you're neutral, neutrally buoyant, floating along with your big suit and all your equipment, is this doable? And we said, hey, we think this is doable. So we then uh, contacted the astronauts and said, okay, guys, uh, start making these cufflinks. Uh, this is one of the astronauts on the space station at the time showing off one of his fine handmade uh, cufflinks. So at this point, we're like, okay, we've got an idea, easy peasy, uh, pretty much done, right? Well, no. Um, we needed another piece of key equipment, which we called the hockey stick. And what this is, is no, that's not a hockey stick. That's some cardboard that, uh, that was cut into that shape. And then it's got this lovely orange tape on it. And this tape is called Kapton tape. And it's uh, Kapton because it's uh, non-conductive. So why, why did we need that? Well, each one of these solar arrays can generate 30 kilowatts of power. You know, that's enough to power 10 average size homes. That's a lot of juice. Um, we're also orbiting in a electrically, electrically charged plasma. 
uh, with, you know, basically super, I shouldn't say super, but good conducting materials. Um, even Earthshine reflecting off the solar rays is enough to produce some power generation. And remember, I mentioned earlier that these solar rays were flapping a little bit. You know, they had motion. They weren't structurally sound. So imagine you're an astronaut um, and you're in a metal spacesuit, uh, working in a plasma, touching a flapping electrically charged solar array. I think you can imagine that it could end up being a very bad day. So we gave the crew uh, that was going to do this, um, this hockey stick. So basically, he can, if the solar array started drifting towards him, he could kind of like poke it away a little bit. And hopefully we'd be far enough away that uh, there'd be no electrical shocks or, or uh, arcs or anything like that. So that was our, our real high tech uh, tool that we made. Um, this is what we call it a cuff checklist. This is actually the astronauts uh, when they're out on a spacewalk. It's hard to kind of pull out a book and look at diagrams. So they actually have a uh, little cardboard uh, checklist that kind of stick on their cuffs. Uh, this is it. And basically this was telling them, here's, uh, we, we made uh, long, short, and medium cufflinks. And this is where the structural engineer said, if we put them, that we could maybe make this array uh, structurally sound enough that as we extended it, this tear would not keep going. Uh, obviously, this would kind of be right over that one. You can almost think of this one more as a Band-Aid, and then these would keep the other sections from tearing further. Okay, well, how do we get the astronauts out there? Uh, doing a spacewalk is, is one thing, but um, this is the, um, oh, actually, you may not be able to see my pointer. Um, this is the airlock. This is where uh, the astronauts would come out to do a spacewalk. This is where, and actually, I'm sorry, it's the upper one, the 4B. We're looking at the P6 module, uh, the 4B set of arrays. It's over here where the tear is. So, there's a long way to go to get there. And of course, you can't just shimmy out on this because um, of the electrical charges like I was talking about. So um, how are we going to get the astronauts out there? Well, it's a little Rube Goldberg. Um, here again is that mobile transporter outlined in red and uh, the robotic arm, a little bit hard to see here, but here's that robotic arm. Now, we could take this little mobile transporter uh, go down as far as it can go, but this is where the tracks end. So that's as far as this guy could go. And I don't have a good diagram showing it, but if it was there and it extended the, the robotic arm, it would go about here, which is close, but no cigar. You're not going to get an astronaut out there to do a repair. So what did we do there? Well, um, many of you are probably aware that um, in uh, uh, 2003, we lost the Columbia Space Shuttle uh, because some debris had hit it during launch, and we weren't aware that it was uh, damaged uh, the critical tiles so that when it re-entered, it um, uh, burned up. So... On space shuttle missions after that, we sent up this uh, boom called the Orbiter Boom Sensor System. And it's, it's this thing here, this long extension. This is the robotic arm that the space shuttle already had. And it had this boom. And it would fly up in the space shuttle cargo bay. And then after we got in orbit, we would take the robotic arm. It would pick it up uh, with its claw. And then it had, this is a good inset picture in the top left. Um, it would use lasers and cameras to kind of inspect the whole uh, part of the space shuttle. We couldn't see to see if there was any damage. So this is what we were able to uh, uh, cobble together. We figured we had this thing that we could grab with the space station robotic arm. 
So here's the, uh, the station's robotic arm coming in from the top of this picture here, the space station robotic manipulator system. Uh, we just can't call anything simple on, at NASA. Uh, here it has grabbed this orbiter boom um, with it, its claw. And at the end of it, if you look here in the far right, you'll actually be able to make out an astronaut. So that's what we did. We had this arm grab this boom, and with it, we could, um, you know, extend the astronaut out closer. And you can almost think of it as like um, putting a ladder on top of a stool that you put on top of a table uh, to get that extra little bit of feet. Um, just to reach out there. Okay, so we've got our plan. Now it's game time. We need to go see if we can do this. Here are the astronauts uh, getting in their suits and uh, getting ready for uh, the mission. Here's uh, my colleague, uh, Derek, uh, the flight director that was gonna do the spacewalk. Um, he was overseeing the operations of the actual spacewalk. Uh, here's Steve Swanson. He was that astronaut that was out in the, uh, in the facility um, uh, testing with the, with the gloves on that I showed you earlier. So Derek's on the right, Steve is on the left. And uh, as an astronaut, we always have an astronaut as the capsule communicator, as it's called, talking to the astronauts. And since he had done it, he could... Uh, talk them through it and say, you know, okay, here's how it's going to go. Here's what you're going to do. And, uh, oh, if you have a question, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll talk through it. Uh, here again, we have more flight directors and uh, that's uh, Annette on the left there. Uh, we've got an astronaut there sitting down in the, in the chair. Uh, we've got the EVA flight controllers here to the right. And this is in real time as we're like trying to discuss some of the problems that we're encountering and what's going on and trying to work through it. And here we have it. We have uh, Scott Perzinski, the astronaut that uh, drew the short straw or the long straw, depending on how you uh, uh, want to view it. He's at the end of this uh, boom that's attached to the robotic arm. Uh, you can see he's approaching in the upper right. You can see the tear. Uh, so he can get fairly close here. Uh, here's his colleague here that's at the uh, base of the mass. It really gives you a good idea of scale here, of both the uh, solar array mass, the robotic arm, the boom, the astronauts, the solar arrays. Uh, these are all big. Here is a really nice shot from his colleague. And uh, this is uh, as he... Uh, uh, after he had just completed putting the uh, cufflinks in, you can see a few of these white lines here. Uh, if you look carefully at this picture, they're kind of, they don't look pretty and they poke up there. Um, um, and you can see his hockey stick that he was there using to push the solar ray flapping blankets away from him. Uh, he had completed his task, so he took a moment to breathe a sigh of relief and wave, uh, uh, job done guys, you can now extend the solar ray. Uh, here's another picture of, uh, uh, of the cufflinks. You can see a little bit with the, with the light. Uh, here's a nice, you can see the guide wire is very clearly seen here, and you can see several of the cufflinks. And, you know, this is one of those jobs, you know, because remember, he was kind of taking that wire, you know, trying not to touch the solar rays, sticking it through the little hole, pulling on it to get it to have that little flap to engage, and then move over to the other one um, and uh, do it on the other side. So not pretty. And just one more picture where you can see the cufflinks and the tear. And at this point, they're now trying to extend uh, the solar array. And lo and behold, they, they continued to extend it while he was out there and it was able to go all the way, did not tear any further. And it locked into position and was structurally sound. So we had a successful repair there and the astronauts were able to get back into the space shuttle. The space shuttle was able to undock. And even to this day, we are still flying with these cufflinks holding that solar array together. And by all measurements, it appears to be working just fine. So, um, 
what did we learn out of this? Um, we at NASA always like to take away lessons learned. And um, we did learn some things. Uh, for example, uh, systems are extremely well designed and very strong and robust and carefully tested. Um, but you know what? They still break. Now, root cause here, uh, we think part of the problem was that um, this was the first solar array built when uh, the equipment was being made on the, the ground. And uh, because of delays in the program, it sat uh, bunched up for a number of years and we think the, uh, the lubricant had kind of dried out. And we had enough to open it once, but then when we were closing it up, the lubricant just gave out and it just uh, friction snagged it. The flight control team, you know, never had ever imagined anything like this. Uh, we only had, uh, you know, literally like a day to figure out a solution, uh, test it, develop it, uh, implement it, train it, tell the astronauts how to do it. It really was like Apollo 13. As soon as we had the cufflink idea uh, working while I and my, my colleagues were in the pool diving, uh, we had other guys telling the astronauts how to make those cufflinks and how to make that hockey stick and writing the procedures and uh, putting together as quickly as we could. So uh, flight control, um, we have these um, foundations of flight control, we call it, um, because uh, we live and breathe these things. And these are a couple that uh, are a few that uh, apply today or in this situation. Um, and they're cuff, uh, toughness, uh, competence, and teamwork. And toughness is just being um, determined that you, no matter what's going to happen, you're going to press as hard as you can so that you can persevere. Uh, competence, um, you know, we, people had to know what hardware we had, uh, what, what we were capable of doing. Uh, everything we we could possibly know about those solar arrays so that uh, we could face a situation like this and pull it together. And then teamwork. There is, you know, uh, no way one person was going to think of this, uh, develop it, do it. You know, it was literally hundreds of people uh, working around the clock. So that was a successful one. And uh, there was... Um, uh, more stories like that. And as uh, mentioned before this, there was a book that now, it doesn't talk uh, all tales from the trenches, but there's a lot of things about operations there inside these pages. So uh, I know you're recording this, so there's the link if you would like to download it, it's free. Don't print it out, it's big. <laughs> now, before I go on to the next topic, let me, uh, I could not see the um, chat session, but let me pause here for a moment and open it up for questions. And then I'll, I'll, I'll spend a few minutes talking about commercial crew. But since that's a change in topic, I thought it might be good to uh, take questions now if there are any. Yeah, I saw that uh, Moshe Guy had asked a question earlier. Where is the alpha spectrometer on the ISS? Ah. It's going to throw you a looper here. No, that's a great question. Um, yeah, I guess this. Oh, wait, maybe my first slide might have a picture of it. I can show you where it is schematically, but. Um, No, this one, you can't quite see it here. It's on the top of the truss here that's out of view. So I don't, I don't have a convenient picture, but it's on the truss segment. Um, I want to say it's, it might be on this side. I think it's like sticking out here. What other questions? I think it's, uh, we got some, actually, there is some Q&A here. Um, no, I did not say the uh, explosive space modulator. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, let's see, what is the, uh, can you comment on the Nauka module incident, the real story? 
So yeah, that was something that, I mean, I, I was talking to Dr. Bob about this before we went live, you know, the Russians have uh, two leaks in their module. One they blamed on NASA, uh, Nuaka, they, they, uh, they, they just tried to dock, you know, they're, they're, uh, uh, they're, what, why am I having a blank? They just tried to dock and then uh, sent the ISS into figure eight tumbles, uh, the Russians did. And so can you tell us a little bit more about that? What, what is going on with the Russians? Are they good partners? Um, yeah, there's a couple questions in there and that's a really good question. Um, um, what happened there, first of all, let me answer that part because um, the module actually had been, you know, years late. Um, they had had a lot of technical problems on the ground. And then literally as soon as they launched it, they had serious failures on it. Uh, the propulsion system uh, malfunctioned. Um, some of the antennas didn't deploy. Uh, for the first couple of days, uh, we actually thought we were about to lose the module. Um, because, you know, it launches, it has to deploy solar arrays to get power because otherwise it'll run out of power and die pretty quickly. And, it, and, and even from orbit, it couldn't maintain its attitude well. Uh, multiple pieces of equipment failed to kind of tell it where it is in space. Um, but the Russians, um, now they have a different approach to things. Um, we at NASA, what we like to do is design, design, design test, 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 really pound it flat, try to make it as, as robust and solid as possible. Um, you know, we're, we're more of the uh, measure twice, cut once. Uh, they're more of a measure once, good enough, now cut, um, because we'll figure it out on, as we go along. Um, now, to, uh, to the testament to that kind of approach, um, you know, one prominent person described the module as um, a uh, hay wagon on fire from the launch. And, uh, but they were able to stabilize it. They were able to manually deploy the solar arrays. They were able to manually figure out how to point it in space and uh, get it on its way. So um, we, uh, we were monitoring that and I'll say more about it in the commercial crew because it had more direct impacts to me. And then when it docked, well, actually, even before it docked, because of these problems, we were concerned that um, uh, because one of the problems they had had was um, some propellant tanks had been um, opened up to high pressure tanks and uh, damaged. So we knew that there was leaking propellant and we were actually worried that once it docked, we would have leaking propellant getting all over the space station. So we were focused on that. So, okay, now how do we dock and immediately dump that propellant and it docked. We said, okay, good, it's docked. And we were getting ready to dump the propellant and they had a software misfire and it started firing thrusters. And before we knew it, we were, we were tumbling. Um, now, again, this is a good example where space station is pretty robust. Um, eventually their software, well, actually their system ran out of fuel. Um, and uh, at that point, the uh, space station could kind of uh, stabilize and um, um, they could recover it and take it back to attitude. So that was a very uh, tense kind of period as we were, you know, because at first, you know, it docked, we thought, okay, that's good. And then suddenly, you know, you start getting these thruster firings and you start building up a rate. And, you know, there's, you know, red lights and alarms will go off that something's wrong. But it took the flight controllers a few minutes to go, okay, now what's going wrong? Well, wait a second, my, my gyroscopic rate's going up, my telemetry showing this, I'm seeing thrusters firing when I'm not supposed, and you had to kind of put it together and it was like, oh, the Russian MLM module is firing out of control. What are we gonna do? How long is it gonna go? Oh, wait, we're gonna lose communications here real quick because the antenna is gonna start pointing away from the the satellite and it just they had to put it together relatively quickly and then figure out how to adapt and recover so that kind of if I, I know we can go on this stuff all night but so are the russians good partners are they are they can we can we see a future 
with them. I mean, they've said, you know, that we got to use a trampoline to get to the ISS. They've, they've said they blame NASA for, for air leaks in their own module. I mean, is there, is there a future with Russia that you see? Yeah, I, I, I do think they're good partners and that there's a future. Um, first of all, people who make comments like you can use a trampoline are high level, you know, politicians, essentially, they've got to, you know, uh, get their statements out there, their sound bites. Um, the, the, the troops that work together, the flight directors, the flight controllers on both sides, you know, we work well together. And what I like about it, you know, when the space shuttle wasn't flying, we had the Soyuz, we could keep the space station up there. They got capabilities we don't. Um, what, what I see is, you know, I mentioned earlier, the NASA way and the Russian way. Um, I, to be honest, I think sometimes the NASA way is way over uh, overkill. Um, you know, we sit around a room and we go, this could happen, let's, let's prevent it. Well, we never really take into account, well, how likely is that? You know, if it's a one in a million chance that that thing's gonna fail, do you really wanna spend a few hundred thousand dollars trying to make a redundant version of it? Um, whereas the Russians probably are a little too cavalier. And I think what's really been good is I think we often meet in the middle. You know, we, we try to pull them in a little bit. We, they pull us in a little bit. And I, I, what's interesting about it is SpaceX, I think, is very similar. Um, and I'll say more about them in a moment. But they, you know, they're, they're kind of a young can-do NASA. They want to they wanna do things quick. Um, you know, there was one time where they were about to launch and they realized that uh, for the thrust that they needed that day, that the, uh, uh, the engine bell on the rocket motor was too long. Well, they sent a guy out with a hacksaw and he cut a few inches off and they launched and everything was fine. That's probably a little too cavalier if we're going to launch astronauts with our kind of rockets. But, you know, sometimes maybe we, we overthink it. Uh, I do see one more question in there. Um, has the ISS ever been hit by space junk? And uh, not like shown on gravity. Um, that, that is our worst nightmare. Uh, and I'm serious. A lot of people lay at night, wait, wake at night thinking about that. Um, but um, it, it does get hit all the time. Uh, if it's big like on gravity, we use the, uh, the rocket engines and we, we, or we maneuver out of it because we can see it coming. Uh, notwithstanding the plot device that was there. If it's really small, like, you know, small particles and stuff, it, 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 it hits, it hits the debris shields. We find things pocked uh, holes all over the space station. Uh, we haven't had anything serious at this point. And uh, Steve did have another question about that. I'm sorry, Frank, I didn't want to step on you. Um, but Steve had another question too. Just, you know, the pathway to get the job uh, but maybe you want to say that for a little bit until after you're kind of wrapping here. But, you know, how do you how do you do it? Were you in the military, you know, uh, work for a contractor? How long are you with NASA? How do you get the how do you get the sweet gig? Let me answer that one right now. Um, um, by following your passion. And the reason why I say that is we have everything you just said. We've got military people. Uh, we've got people who, you know, went in and studied uh uh, aerospace engineering in college, and this is what they wanted to do, uh, and they got a job. We've got astronomers like me who, you know, hey, I worked at Hubble. I like space stuff. I liked operations. They were hiring. They hired me. I used to, I, I've worked with um, English majors, math majors, poli-sci majors. Um, what we want is smart people that are willing to throw their passion and intelligence into it. We'll teach you the job. We'll tell you everything you need to know about the space station. Now, I happen to know a lot about computers, which was very helpful when we were building the computer system. So, and that, that's another tale from the trench when all the computers failed on the space station. Um, that was one of my uh, 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 busiest, longest days ever in my life, um, trying to figure out how to get uh, some 386 uh, computers back to life. And if you remember what a 386 chip is, uh, you know, that's not much of a, a computer. So anyway, um, follow the, uh, follow your passion and just be good at it. And then, you know, if you're interested in, in flight control, um, you know, apply. Okay, let me talk a little bit. You asked me to talk a briefly about um, commercial crew program. 
So I wanted to take a few minutes about that and then uh, we, we can talk whatever questions you guys still have. Um, for those that are not familiar with it, when the space shuttle retired in uh, um, 2011, uh, we wanted to have a replacement vehicle um, and we, we created a, a, a commercial crew program. Now it had its roots in 2004 off of what we called the commercial orbital transportation or COT system or the commercial resupply services. And basically what this was was, a, was providing seed money to private companies, SpaceX being one of them, uh, uh, Northrop Grumman being another, uh, and some other people like Sierra Nevada and stuff like that were out there. And uh, we paid them some money, said, you design the spacecraft. Um, and then once you design it to our very high level requirements uh, and build it and test it, we'll buy services from you, kind of like a taxi service. That was very successful. Um, we've done, I've lost track how many millions of dollars of these uh, missions and how many missions, something like 30 or 40. Um, so in 2010, uh, we started, because we knew the shuttle was retiring, we started the commercial crew program to replace it. And what's different with these two programs is in the past, like back in Apollo 13 days, uh, NASA would write down every single requirement that they wanted uh, for every, you know, even down to the, the screws that were going to be used. And the, they would say, okay, now who can build it? And then they would take the, the cheapest bid and they would make them build it. But it was NASA owned stuff like that. And actually it's, you guys owned it, you know, as taxpayers, we owned it. We could, we could get that intellectual property anytime we wanted. These programs though, NASA said, Hey, we'll give you a little money. You've got to put some of your own money in it. Um, but then it's your, it's yours. So we'll give you high level requirements. You build it as you see fit. We'll check it out and say, yeah, we agree or we don't agree with that. And then you fly it. So um, there is a lot of uh, rounds of uh, down selecting here. And in 2014, NASA picked uh, SpaceX's Dragon and Boeing's uh, CST-100 Starliner uh, to be the finalists. And the reason why they picked two is because like, you know, for example, when uh, the space shuttle wasn't flying, we were using the Soyuz. And when the Soyuz was grounded, we were using the shuttle. So having two is good. Um, and uh, so both companies were off and running in 2014. In 2019, SpaceX had their uncrewed test flight known as Demo-1 or DM-1. And uh, a little over a year later, they had their crew test flight. Whoops, typo there. Um, but that was successful. And so they passed uh, um, with flying colors and uh, now have been doing uh, crewed flights since November of 2020. And next month, we're going to do um, the second, the well, we're going to launch our third crewed Dragon to the space station. And the second crewed Dragon is going to come home. And here's just a couple pictures. This is the uh, uh, Crew True, their, their patch. We're on increment 65, meaning the 65th team of astronauts to the space station. And here's a picture of the Dragon as it was coming. You know, here's the launch, and here it is coming to the space station. You need to share That's your screen. Not sharing your screen, yeah. Oh, my God. Sorry. What happened there? I thought I was you still in NASA sharing. scientist has trouble with Zoom. I feel much better. Said there was sharing. Okay. Um, Thank you. So here's the words I was saying. So you have those. Here's the picture. So on the right, that's the launch. Here's the dragon as it's coming in to dock to the uh, space station. Increment 65 patch and the astronauts crew two patch. So. A um, couple pictures from uh, just this last week. We had the uh, Inspiration4 crew. This is not an IS or commercial crew program. Uh, it was just a very cool SpaceX mission that happened last week. We also have Axiom. Now, this is space station, but it's not commercial crew. Um, and what this is, is um, uh, Axiom has uh, this company. Uh, it's a 
startup company, uh, has partnered with SpaceX, uh, shown here in the upper right, uh, to ferry private astronauts to the space station. And we're going to have some private astronauts go up, uh, hopefully February or a little bit later uh, next year to the space station um, and conduct some uh, private uh, research, some private uh, uh, commercial operations. Uh, and Axiom Company is actually planning, uh, I put a little, uh, uh, there's a module here. Um, I'm kind of trying to circle it here that uh, they want to attach to the front of the space station and then launch Dragon vehicles to it. So again, not commercial crew, but it's commercial space that's going on that I thought was kind of cool. And let's see, you guys probably want to hear a little bit more about Starliner because that's something that I've been working on for uh, the last number of years. And uh, uh, Boeing selected NASA to do the flight operations, basically to fly the vehicle. Um, SpaceX, um, they have their own flight controllers that they, uh, uh, you know, hired and trained out in Hawthorne. Um, but uh, we, uh, Boeing decided that rather than hire their own team, they'll just have NASA flight controllers do it because uh, we have a lot of experience. Here's our mission patch for the first orbital flight test, uh, which we executed. It was launched in December of 2019 called the Orbital Flight Test, OFT. And uh, things did not go well with it. Um, there's this thing called a mission elapsed timer, MET. That's what we, we uh, uh, go from. If you remember Apollo 13, when there'd be a launch, they'd go, the clock is ticking. Well, that's what it is. It starts uh, at zero as soon as we lift off and then we go from it. Now, um, some software error that they later discovered what it was, but basically it did not reset to zero when the vehicle launched off. And in fact, when it left the pad, the MET was about 12 hours at launch time. Well, why is that important? Well, Starliner, like Dragon, is a completely autonomous vehicle. And it had been designed that we would, it would do a critical orbital insertion burn um, I think you guys all know Newton's law. If you launch this thing, it's just going to do an arc and come back unless you do an orbital insertion burn. And it was supposed to happen at, a, at about 30 minutes MET. Well, when the computer said, okay, I think I'm supposed to do a, an, an orbital insertion burn here. What time is it? Oh, it's 12 hours. Well, 30 minutes happened, you know, after launch happened a long time ago. That burn already happened. I'm not going to do it. So I was like, oh, crap. Uh, this is when the operation flight control team immediately realized something was wrong. Uh, here I am on console. Um, we're, we're figuring out that something's not right, and we figured out that we needed to manually uh, tell the spacecraft to do this burn. Unfortunately, uh, if you can see my hands, you know, this is what physics would do. This is what we were trying to do to get in orbit but we were kind of coming down when we got that orbital burn. So we were able to get into a stable orbit, but we had used so much propellant, we could not rendezvous with the space station. So instead we landed uh, about 42 hours later. We were able to test out a lot of the spacecraft um, and things actually worked pretty well, except for uh, that software bug. Um, NASA and Boeing uh, put together an independent review team and they discovered that Boeing had inadequate software testing um, because, as I mentioned earlier, um, this is kind of like for profit. Uh, you have to say, build us a spacecraft and we're only going to give you this much money and you've got to put a, your own money in it. Um, NASA's not footing the bill. So these companies say, well, look, I'm going to do this kind of testing. I'm not going to do this kind of testing. This is very expensive. We don't think it's necessary. And, and apparently what they concluded afterwards was, yeah, it was really necessary. You needed to do some more testing there. Um, and I just got a couple more slides here. I'm almost done. So Boeing decided to refly that orbital flight test. Um, and we were planned to launch uh, this last July 30th. Um, we had to scrub it due to that Russian Nauka module that we were talking about earlier. Um, we were actually on the launch pad. We were ready to light the, light the rocket. And then uh, we had uh, this problem, so we couldn't uh, launch. 
So we had to wait a few days to the next window opened up. That was August 3rd. One of the things we do just before launch is what we call a light bulb test, where we take all the valves, the propulsion valves that are critical to let fuel come and go. Um, we open them all up and then we close them. We open them, close them, make sure that they're all working. Well, 13 of the 24 did not open. And that was completely unexpected. Uh, we spent the next seven days trying to um, open them any way we could. We applied heat. We applied extra current. We even shook the area um, sonically to kind of shake them loose. And we got a few open, but not all of them. And unfortunately, by the time uh, we got most of them open, uh, the launch window closed. The United Launch Alliance had to move on to another rocket they had to launch. And so they had to stand down. Uh, the spacecraft has been moved back to its uh, factory, and the Boeing folks have yet to figure out what happened. We, this is something outside of experience base of any thrusters people have had. Um, and once they figure out what happened and how to fix it, uh, Boeing will resume their, uh, their test flights, including the crew test flights, uh, probably middle of next year, I would say, at the earliest. So we'll see what happens there. And then before I close out the talk and open it up to any questions, I did want to do one plug. Uh, I do have uh, other stuff I can talk about, the space station. Uh, here's a cool picture of uh, a Cygnus cargo vehicle docking with the space station in front of the sun. And I'm using this because I could also talk to you guys if you're interested someday uh, doing astronomy from the space station. That's theory of the Galt's picture, isn't it? Uh, I think you're right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We just, he was just one of our speakers just, just recently. So yeah, we, we know that picture. It's, it's a great picture. <laughs> of course. <It> is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, we, oh, I recognize it right away. <laughs> that wasn't Dana's? No, not that time. It wasn't Dana. Dana, uh, he, he did not to shoot that one. I wish he did. I, I bet he wish he did. Um, I guess, so a couple more questions. Um, so uh, with Boeing, a company like Boeing and comparing to SpaceX, I know they're, it's a difficult conversation, um, but you know, SpaceX is so innovative they do things so quickly, so fast, like you were talking about going out and cutting the bell just to get it, get it going. Boeing has had so many problems from their airplanes to just their, you know, the dinosaur that maybe some people think they are, is there, do they have the ability to change and adapt quickly like SpaceX does? SpaceX says that, you know, they can build spacesuits instead of spending a billion dollars on a spacesuit. They want to build spacesuits now, too. Is is that the future of space is, is throwing it to these these quick, fast turnaround companies like that? No, that's a that's a great question. And you know, I have a lot of admiration for SpaceX. They, they you know, they they've got a lot of spunk and I. Uh, uh, maybe too much sometimes, but uh, they they they're they're a good team. Uh, I think the challenge Boeing has had, and and there's a couple challenges here. You know, first of all, they uh, they will admit themselves they they become a big bureaucratic Goliath type project. And what they wanted to do here, they wanted to be innovative. They wanted to say, hey, look, we're going to do it cheaper. We're not going to do it the way we've always done it. Um, so they went in it with good intentions. The problem is uh, they came from, you know, that kind of background that they had. And to make it worse, I think, because I think, because I was there back in the days and there was a number of times where they said, hey, let's do it this way. Let's throw out some of those old ways we did things and let's try and be a little innovative. One of the reasons NASA liked Boeing was because they were used to that comfortable bureaucratic, you know, they could go to Boeing and say, give me a thousand page document that gives me every detail about it, where if you go to SpaceX and say, give me every detail about it, you'll get a three page summary that you're kind of like, well, how does it really work? Uh, so NASA liked Boeing because of that. They encouraged, they pushed Boeing, hey, don't throw that old way of doing things out. Let's keep doing it the way we've been doing it for you know 60 years. And I think NASA kind of held Boeing back. I think Boeing kind of held themselves back. And they've been struggling with it. And I think they underscoped their team. They just had too small of a team to try and, and do what they've been pulling off. And that's why it's been taking a lot more. 
time. No, thanks for the answer. I, I think it's a, it's a, it is a tough question, but that's a, that's a great answer. Thank you. There's, there's a couple more questions uh, from the chat here. Um, I love this one. Is it, uh, is it true that the Russian and U.S. astronauts do not collaborate with work on the ISS and the only time they're actually together is during mealtime? Um, no, that's not quite true. Um, they, it is to the point, um, you know, where the, uh, um, there's enough to do that the Amer I shouldn't say Americans because the U S side, you know, we have Europeans and Japanese and Canadians, um, you know, they can pretty much be on the U S O S side, the U S segment as it's called. And the Russian cosmonauts can pretty much be on the Russian side and they, they literally could work for days and never see each other. Um, one rule that they implemented early on is they would get together for a meal regardless. So that makes sure that they stay the team. Um, but they, uh, they, they, they collaborate. Uh, there's been times, you know, uh, um, kind of related to your question earlier, um, the Russians probably, um, you know, where they, they make bluster about making a trampoline and they're going to launch their own space station in a few years that they say every couple years, um, but they don't have the resources to do it. And like there was a phase where uh, they didn't have a lot of experiments up there and, you know, they had free time with their cosmonauts. So they would come out and help in the U.S. segment. And there's been times where we've had, there's been experiments on the Russian segment that they needed help with and we help them out with it. So there's definitely collaborations and it depends on what's going on at the time. Great. Um, another question that came in from the, uh, from the gallery here. What are the factors, components that dictate the ultimate lifespan of the ISS? How long can it last? Life support components, structural fatigue, or less things wearing out? What, how long can you keep that thing running uh, before it just can't run anymore. Yeah, um, you know, aircraft are, are very similar because, you know, if, if, if you build a, a, an aircraft right uh, and you maintain it, you know, it can pretty much go indefinitely. You know, you might change out the avionics now and then, you might put a new motor in it, um, you know, stuff like that, but it, it can be pretty robust. And that's that's how the space station is on the US side. Um, and of course, we've been extremely conservative um, in, in anything that we're treating it with. Uh, you know, like most things, it was over designed from the beginning to get extra factors of margin, but we still try to treat it with kid gloves. Uh, we're constantly upgrading stuff. Um, and uh, there's definitely some key parts of the structure that have a limited life. Um, I think you, that sort of stuff, you're probably in the, the tw you know, well into the 2030s, if not around 2040, before you really start hitting that. Um, I don't have a picture of it. You can Google it. Um, we, you know, we have those solar arrays. They're degrading. You know, little micrometeoroids are destroying panels. Wires are breaking. They're putting out less and less power. Uh, so earlier this year, we started sticking on extra solar rays, you know, if this was the old ray, we now got this other array that's sticking on top of it that we, uh, the IROSA that kind of, you know, we just stuck it on and uh, that provides extra power now. So, you know, we've been able to, um, uh, you know, upgrade it a little bit that way to keep it going. So I think we've got at least probably to 2035 if we've got the political interest and money. Now where the, the challenge is, um, you know, the Russian segment is definitely showing some age signs. Um, you know, they're investigating it. I don't know off the top of my, of my head, you know, if, you know, what challenges we might have there. As you mentioned, the leak, uh, there's definitely been some structural issues there. I don't know if that's uh, a design, manufacturing, or just an age issue with that. To your point, I would put out, uh, point out that the youngest b-52 bomber in active service is 58 years old oh my the most recent one <laughs> well how many miles has the iss flown though i mean that, you know, <laughs> yeah. I, i'd say that's got to be in the millions and millions and millions um ann has a question uh she's just curious what is the male female ratio on the iss is it uh it, it's pretty much predominantly almost always male isn't it um, there's probably a skew there. 
um, and I'm trying to think of the uh, five that are up there right now. We do have one woman. Um, now, uh, it's skewed partly because the cosmonauts, the Russians, uh, I think they have one female astronaut in their entire contingent. Um, that's a cultural challenge that they have. Um, and uh, I'd have to look up how many, what the numbers are. I know the last couple of classes of astronauts have been roughly 50 50. Um, but um, right now, it's, you know, of the uh, three that we have up there, it's one, one female on the US side. Um, in the flight control side of it, you know, on the ground control, uh, I can tell you it is pretty close to 50-50. Are you going to be uh, uh, working the console when Tom Cruise goes into space? <laughs> um, you know, it's funny. Uh, I, I met Tom Cruise in mission control. Uh, God, it was like, 20 years ago, he was, I think he was researching for some movie. I can't remember what movie that would have been. Maybe he just wanted to hang out, but he came in disguise. Um, he didn't want to, uh, uh, you know, get a lot of attention. And he sat in the control room for a couple hours and we're all like, who is that guy back there? Uh, and then the flight director finally told us, this was before I was a flight director. And he said, oh, this is Tom Cruise. Please don't tell anyone. So, uh, no, I, uh, since I've stepped over to the science side for a little bit, I probably will not be a uh, flight director for that time frame. Yeah, it's interesting that, you know, the Americans had announced that uh, Tom Cruise is going to go to space. And then a week later, the Russians said, well, we're, <laughs> we're already sending, we're sending a woman up there to do our movie uh, ahead of Tom Cruise. So uh, again, the, again, the Russians, <laughs> the Russians. I, I have a question. Um, how the new parts for the station, how are they brought to, to the station? I mean, now and in the future, if you have new spare parts. Yeah, because uh, we don't have the space shuttle. Um, there, there's multiple cargo vehicles. Uh, we have the cargo dragon vehicle that SpaceX builds. We have the Cygnus vehicle that uh, Northrop Grumman builds. Um, the Russians have the progress vehicle. So we can take up stuff now it's it's got to be stuff that can only fit inside one of those vehicles or the, the 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 spacex dragon actually has what we call the trunk an external area where it can take some stuff out um, but we're limited to that now the, the the biggest problem we have is actually getting stuff back um, because most of those vehicles um, the japanese htv vehicle the Cygnus vehicle, the Progress vehicle, you put trash in them and you burn them up. They re-enter the atmosphere and they burn up. Uh, the Cygnus car, I'm sorry, the, the SpaceX Dragon is the only vehicle that comes back, splashes down in the water. So we can return some stuff. But it and jettisons the trunk though. So it doesn't- It gets rid of the trunk. So it can't yeah. bring back anything external. Um, but it can bring back, uh, the, the cargo part can bring back, you know, pressurized cargo. Um, and of course, the crewed vehicle can bring back a smaller amount, you know, that the astronauts take up a, a certain volume. Um, and that's a real challenge because, um, you know, for a long time when we were building the space station, uh, we couldn't do as much science as we wanted to. Now we've got a lot of astronauts up there. We can take cargo up. We're doing science out the wazoo. The problem is a lot of that science you have alloy samples or fro frozen biological samples uh, that you have to get down to the ground. And we actually are now getting to the point where um, all the freezers on the space station are jam full and we can't get the stuff down fast enough. And like we're in a few months, we're going to be returning some blood samples that have been up there for six months because it's just, it's hard getting it down. Here's another great question. Um, what about uh, cooperating with the Chinese in the future? Is that something they have their own space station now? Is that something, I, I think that there's a law against actually working with the Chinese, but is that something that uh, maybe NASA might pursue and, and in the hopes of maybe getting a little closer together? Uh, NASA is very interested in pursuing that, you know, within the law. Unfortunately, because I think it's called the Wolf Amendment, 
we are not allowed to interact uh, with, with the Chinese. Uh, in fact, um, the book that I mentioned earlier, uh, a Chinese researcher uh, asked if he could uh, translate it into Chinese so that his students could use it. And NASA couldn't even say yes to that um, because we're not allowed to interact formally with them. Now, of course, it's out on the internet. It's in the public domain. NASA can't stop them from translating it, but we couldn't even go and say, yeah, please go ahead, whatever you want, um, because we can't. But I, I think it would be good, um, you know, if, if really to go back to the moon and Mars, it, it takes such an effort. It's so expensive. It's so involved. You need a lot of partners. Um, uh, I'll be honest, you know, uh, I can't say this for certain, but this is Dr. Bob's personal opinion. Um, you know, we've had some real tensions with Russia over the years. You know, Ukraine is a good example. Um, and while at the working troop level, you know, we don't see those political stuff, we just kind of do our jobs. But I do have to believe that there are times when the leaders go, well, you know, we've got $100 billion invested in this thing. We can't go poke those guys in the eye and cut our arm off and say, we're going to cut all ties with you, you know, because we don't like what you're doing politically. Um, so I think there is some bonding that's done by that. You learn how to do other projects. We've learned a lot working with the Russians. I think uh, we could learn a lot from, you know, working with the Chinese. Yeah, I agree. I, I hope that uh, I hope we find better ways to, to work together. Uh, a couple of questions uh, just here at the end and we'll kind of wrap things up, though. Um, I know right now SpaceX, Elon Musk says it's about $50 million per seat to uh, take the Dragon up right now, somewhere in that range, $50 million. Um, Moshe had asked, you know, is it is it always going to be, is space always going to be a place for just the very, very rich? Is there any chance that, uh, Courtney uh, Stackoff asked, is there any chance that we'll be able to go into space as something that's actually affordable? $50 million is a little out of most of our budgets. Yeah, I, I sure hope so. Um, I, uh, I, I know my wife has been worried that, you know, I'm going to try to put down a deposit on one of these missions, but uh, um, I think so. I mean, I, you know, you're already seeing with like Virgin Galactic and Blue Origin cheaper missions. Now, I know I still can't afford them, um, but, you know, hopefully we'll see the same sort of thing we saw with uh, airplanes. You know, initially only the rich could afford to go cross country or across the sea. And, and you know, now it's, it's affordable by, by most people. I think it's going to take a while, um, but you know, um, that's what I think is the beauty of what Elon Musk and these others have done. Uh, they're bringing the cost down, just, you know, manufacturing rockets, manufacturing hardware. Um, and that can only bring the total cost of spaceflight down. And if the interest is there and they do it safe enough not to scare people away, um, I'm really hoping I, I may never get that opportunity, but I'm really hoping in my lifetime that it comes down to something that, uh, more and more people are doing routinely. Yeah, me too. I, I, you know, watching inspiration Four, I got a little dust in my eye a few times watching not only the uh, Netflix show, uh, the, the four episodes that they've shown on there, which are fantastic if you haven't seen it. Um, and just, you know, and watching those guys, these, these, these just, pretty much normal people that are just space enthusiasts that uh, had this, this amazing opportunity to go into space and, and zip around for four days or three days and change. And, and I hope that so many more of us will get to do that. And I hope that uh, whether it's SpaceX or whether it's Blue Origin or, or NASA eventually, I don't think it'll be NASA, but, you know, but that we have these opportunities to go up and, and to, uh, you know, to, to see what very few people have seen before. And that's looking back at Earth and to see, you know, how that how that changes you. And I, I think that it has changed people that get that opportunity to go look back at Earth and, and see this little this little blue blob below us where all history has ever happened. 
but on that, you know, uh, do you have anything else to add? Is there any other questions? Well, thank you, Dr. Bob. Yeah, that was my pleasure. Thanks. It's great to have you as a member. And uh, yeah, we'll, we'll talk to you next September. <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's fine. But, you know, I, I was, um, you know, when you were going through your new members and stuff, I, I don't recall getting a renewal thing. So do I need to renew? No, I think I think we got you covered on that one, Dr. Bob. I think, okay. I think, I think we got you on that. Uh, it's uh, it's great. So uh, definitely say hi to Tom Cruise and Zenu for us. And <laughs> will do. <laughs> and uh, and thanks again, everybody. We'll uh, we'll talk to you guys uh, next month. And don't forget all the events we got coming up: International Observe the Moon uh, Night, and there's so many other things too. So uh, please check the website. And uh, thanks. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Thanks very much. Very nice talk. Very nice. My absolute pleasure. Thank you. Have a good night. Bye-bye.